Good evening everyone, my name is Ian Dewar. I'm lead chaplain at the Morecambe Bay Trust, based mainly, although not exclusively, at the Royal Lancaster Infirmary. And I'm Debbie Wilde, lead chaplain at Furness General Hospital. Welcome to our service of remembrance for 2021. 2021 has been a tough year like 2020. And although at times there's been little easing of restrictions towards the latter end of the year, we know, as we can see from government announcements, it's getting tougher again. This year we're going to aim for a slightly more reflective service than last year and that means is that much of our music will be instrumental. What we're also going to do to give a slight difference to it is have different voices. Most people when you say what's a frontline worker in healthcare think of doctors and nurses but there's all sorts of people behind the scenes who help that thing, those things happen and help look after our loved ones and as we go through this service and seek to mark out their lives those voices are the ones that we'll be hearing. Our first interview this evening is with Professor Mike Thomas, a Chair of the Board of Trustees. Mike is going to set the scene for 2021 and the challenges is presented across the Bay. I mean, because you started, just remind me, is it January 2020? Yeah, yeah. So you became Chair in January 2020, you had no other connection with the Trust whatsoever, and within two months you were in a pandemic. We were, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did you cope with that? Well, it was... It, it, it was interesting because, to be fair, the trust and the staff, have, and I'm, I'm not saying this to flatter people, were just magnificent. We had some early warning that the pandemic was coming. We had PPE equipment. We started to test people early in the trust. We had lots and lots of briefing from the NHS in London and regionally about what was coming from public health. We got an idea of the scale of it, and that enabled us to have a few days, if I'm honest, maybe two or three weeks, to plan extra beds, emergency beds, increase of ITU, increase of the use of PPE, how we would get patients out of hospital, how we would isolate it for infections. And then that's it. That was it for the full year, is just treating people, dealing with people coming in, doing what we can to get people better, getting them into convalescence and rehab. And that's been the focus of the NHS, really. I would say up to probably this July. But we still had to keep other things going. You know, we still had to oversee the business of, of the trust, deal with the energy requirements, the fuel requirements, the, the finances, deal with all the other issues like maternity, which still had to run. We did what we could with emergency services. And then this July, try to bring everything very, very quickly, very quickly back online, deal with the long waiting list that had been built up, the elective surgery, getting wards back to normal running, and still deal with COVID cases that were coming through. And then, of course, in summer, all the other pressures. Yeah, I mean, one of those pressures uh, over the past 18 months, 20 months, really, has been... Uh, patients dying when relatives haven't even been able to get in. I mean, how do you, you as a chair and the non-executive directors kind of respond to that or, or handle that? The first reaction is just, really? Really? Is this what we have to do? You know, people are dying and they're on their own. But people can't be visited. That's the first reaction. It's that human reaction of, really? Uh, then, then you get the regulatory requirements and you think, right, so how do we make the place safe? We recognise the risks, um, but you never lose that human, that human element of this doesn't seem right. You know, this, the sooner we can get people to see their relatives, even if it's through glass or they can talk online. And you know, some of the staff here have been brilliant with taking devices so people can talk to each other, uh, making sure there are glass uh, barriers between people uh, and then people die we, we lost some of our own staff you know the, it, it brings home to you how serious it is and how serious the condition is um, and th that's part of our community really that that's painful I would say right thank you for your thoughts
We're now going to hear two different interviews from different parts of the Trust on the challenges that they've had to face since March 2020, continuing all the way through this year in 2021. Dave, tell us, mate, what's it like being a porter? What do you do as a porter? Well, as a porter, what we do is all over the whole hospital. So we're one of the few workers in the hospital who range over the, completely over the whole site, which I like doing. And um, we move patients from ward to ward, patients who might be going from A&E to an appropriate ward for them or being moved on. We transfer patients to scans, that's to their x-rays, MRI scans, CT scans. Uh, we move bloods around the hospital. Um, we do, it's part of the ritual of people's lives and people don't like to speak about it very much, but part of our role is to um, take patients once they've moved on down to the mortuary and deal with on-site visitings on that. Uh, we move a lot of the waste from the hospital. We spend a lot of time interacting and chatting with uh, the staff because that's who we mostly work with is the staff on the wards and the patients. Um, although we might just be moving them from ward to a scanning room or ward to ward, we're sometimes the people with the uh, the headspace and the time to spend a bit of time with the patients. So, I mean, listening to you talk, one of the fascinating things is you must be pretty clued up in infection prevention because you're going everywhere aren't you and given the last 20 months we've been through has that been quite a stress for you? In, it's been stressful but in a way it's been good because before the pandemic as porters we were aware of how infections can get around the hospital but it's not something that necessarily many other people were bothered about and we kind of felt like we were banging our heads against a brick wall. Now, because of the pandemic, everyone's really aware that, you know, if you walk off a ward without washing your hands and then press a button, that you, um, that's been great. To be honest, although that's extra work, we've been the people who've known all along that that's an issue. Let's come back to your uh, point about uh, moving patients down to the mm. of patients who've died. I mean, uh, there is, uh, people may not know this, a kind of four hour rule that if somebody dies in a ward within four hours they then move, need to be moved down uh, yeah. to mortuary and, and but what's that like when you walk into room you may never have seen this patient before suddenly there's somebody's loved one they're in a bed what does that feel like to actually walk into that it can be it can be unnerving because sometimes you might know the patient because maybe they've been for several scans before they've passed away and you've maybe have taken them for the scans um you know and sometimes you see the family outside as you're going in or you've seen them in the preceding few days so these things often don't come out of nowhere, you know, and the strongest thing I get is I feel like I'm part of a ritual that's going on in terms of what's happening with someone and that, that they are still under our care, even, and we are part of that very important process that then becomes the funeral, that then becomes the period of saying goodbye to someone and so yeah, I feel like we're just part of that. And I think a lot of the porters feel that. And we treat that patient with as much respect as we would anybody else. It's, it's fascinating. They're, they're in our care for that period of time. We are broadcasting now our service to people who've been bereaved. We're moving towards Christmas. Is there any message you'd like to give to those people? Well, just that we're never alone. That's one thing I learned working in a large organisation like this. We might feel alone and lonely, but really we're not. And if you are feeling lonely, just reach out. There's always someone there. If you are bereaved and alone, even the bereavement office, that's what they're there for. Just give them a bow. Dave, thank you very much indeed for your time. You're welcome. started employment in the health service in 1975. 1975, that's some time isn't it? It's just, uh, just a few years. Just a few years, and, uh, but presumably this is your first pandemic. My very first pandemic. <laughs> How have you coped so far? It's been a little bit challenging, um, but the thing that I've got out of it is that our hospitals come together as a team, rather than being individual little places. So. One of the things that people notice about the hospital, and it's larger because the visiting is restricted, is that there are like little kind of bubbles of wards, aren't there? That's certainly early on that was the case. But is that 
that, true that's, it, it's true of the wards, but um, the wards can be a bubble. Uh, but down here, we've because we've got all different wards coming, and not just wards, we've got contractors coming in because there's a lot of work outside work being done. Uh, we're more of a hub, so basically, we have to follow. Even though the rest of the country's changed on the outside, on the inside, um, basically we have to still treat it as it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Because we're a hub, we're getting people from different wards coming down and everything. So everybody congregates into one place. So we still need to stick to the strict uh, distancing, wearing of masks, and we have hand gels for people to use as well. And one of the things that people watching uh, this service of remembrance will think most of all is that you, of course, will have supplied meals for their loved ones. Yes, we have. And we're, um, within the catering department, <clears throat> we were chosen um, in an email form because we visit every ward and, in effect, every patient. Even though we hand the food over to the nurses and they take it to the patient, we became a delivery system for um, letters, and photographs for the patients. So we were like an in-between part and we have followed people's journey uh, from coming in to leaving. And we followed one that actually went as a bad um, ending. Uh, and the family actually uh, thanked us afterwards for being able to keep the contact going. That's a lovely role. How do your staff feel about that? Um, they felt valued um, as, as team members um, and, and, uh, and obviously um, when, when it's the worst thing, when you've been delivering this communication to a patient and then all of a sudden it stops for a bad reason, people feel upset about that. But when it's a good reason, when people are, are actually leaving the hospital because they're well and the food plays an important part in uh, in. in getting people better because the body needs the food to regenerate uh, with through the nutrition side they feel as though it's an important part of a patient's recovery so that gives them a bit of a good feeling as well so in a, in a sense it's been a tough time because it's a pandemic but it, it, there's been some incredible good come out of it for yeah. you and your staff yeah. yeah yeah it made people feel part of the team rather than being oh this is catering um, hospital food and people have a bit of a perception about hospital food and there's often jokes about it in television series and things like that hospital food um, our trust believes in um, food made on the premises so we've got we've got control of nutritious food other hospitals have gone down the the uh, system whereby it's a little bit like, and I'm going to say aeroplane food, in the case of it's all pre-packed and you just stick it in a steamer and heat it up. But we're in control of fresh food all the time. All our things are made fresh. Ian, that's fantastic. Just one final thing. If you had a message to give to people who've lost a loved one over the past uh, 12 months, what would that be from the catering staff? From the catering staff, um, that's a difficult one really because um, we're proud of being able to help where we could um, and we are sorry for anybody's losses along the way. Um, just stay safe and what I normally say is keep smiling. Ian, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That was two very different perspectives. Dave mentioned the key part that the porters play in their care to the deceased and how they see themselves as a service very much at the heart of our care to the bereaved. A key element of our bereavement service is offered by our mortuary staff who care for our loved ones before they depart to the funeral directors and the formal service of a funeral is organised. How do they see their care in this setting? Jay, you're the mortuary manager at the Trust. How long have you been mortuary manager? Uh, I've been mortuary manager for around about 11 years now. Right. And has it particularly tough in the past couple of years, I would have thought? I think the past couple of years has been the toughest I've known. Uh, we've had lots of periods of busyness, if you will, but the past couple of years has been extremely busy. 
I've got to ask the question. Let's imagine that you're out one evening, you bump into somebody, you get chatting, you've not met them before, and they say, what do you do? What do you say? I work for the NHS. <laughs> do you not tell them you're a mortuary manager? I do. I work for the NHS and then I work for pathology. Uh, and then you get the probing questions of what do you do in pathology? And then I might open the conversation there. And how do you describe a mortuary manager? I, I describe myself really as an anatomical pathology technician that manages a mortuary. Okay, that's a very grand title, that's right, yeah. It's another angle that people, oh, what's an anatomical pathology technician? Okay, so um, we're stood here now in the mortuary at Lancaster, but behind you is a room. Can you tell me what that room is called? Yeah, so this is the, the viewing room. So this is where families will come to see their loved one um, after they've passed away, either on a ward or from the community. And and how does that happen? Talk me through that, because you could say that to people and say, well, what do I do? Do I stand at the window? Do I go in? How, what happens if a family comes in, um, their loved one has died uh, and COVID restrictions are in place? Talk me through exactly what would happen then. So they would contact us to make an appointment, first of all, to come and see their loved one. Um, we would follow all the COVID uh, precautions in terms of masks, make sure they, they're aware they have to wear a mask. Um, they would come into the room, into the, the waiting room first of all, then you would come in here and then we would go into the next room and see mum, dad, brother, whoever it is they may come to see. And do families find that a very important part of the grieving process? Absolutely. Uh, I think during COVID we did more family viewings than we've ever done before because, because of the COVID restrictions, the local funeral directors, well national funeral directors, put a blanket no on, on funerals at the chapel arrest in their, their premises. So we took on a lot more viewing from families um, because they wanted to come obviously to see their loved one before they were for the funeral service. How does that make you and your staff feel when you're doing these viewings? It's a very rewarding job because uh, some people don't want to come at all and there's no right or wrong way of doing things. Some people don't want to come to the mortuary at all. The word mortuary scares some people, but some people want to see their loved one after they've passed away. So. If we can offer that service during normal times, as well as COVID times, to come here to see the other one, then, then great, we will do whatever we can. How many members of staff do you have? We've got a team of five across Morecambe Bay. Uh, so we're only a very small team. Uh, so we're here during normal working hours anyway, but we're offering on-call service as well, so for emergency things outside working hours. So if families want to come in the evenings or at the weekends, and they're not able to get here during the working day for whatever reason, then they can come here outside normal working hours as well. So it's a very specialised kind of area of work then? It is. Yeah, it definitely is. It's, it's not easy. You meet some um, families who are obviously quite distraught, because for especially an unexpected death. Um, but by bringing them here, they come to see whoever it is that's passed away, they take a lot of comfort out of that. And then we get a lot of job satisfaction from that as well. Chair, thank you very much indeed for your time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
I sometimes think that in moments of crisis or challenge, it's the old language that carries more weight for us and more resonance. In the piece of poetry that's been read for us, and I say poetry because not everybody necessarily uh, has faith in God, so we can take it as poetry as well as a religious piece of poetry that Lindsay has read for us. It contains that fantastic phrase, the valley of the shadow of death, that resonates and is in the English language. The valley of the shadow of death. Before we focus on that, I want to broaden out a wee bit about what that psalm is about, that piece of poetry is about. At its heart lies a very simple theme. It's a journey. Somebody's being led on a journey. It's almost like a metaphor for the journey of life. You think it's kind of going to be okay, then suddenly you hit the valley of the shadow of death. And then beyond that, there's some hope. But that valley of the shadow of the death is a key thing for us, because ultimately, all human life is lived in the shadow of that valley. We're born, we die. Tragedy is only around the corner. Who'd have thought three years ago we were heading for a pandemic? All of us here watching this service tonight and remembering are affected by that shadow. We're affected in all sorts of ways. But in particular, I think we're affected by the notion of loss that that shadow brings. And yet, if you think about it, one very simple point is this, I've noticed over the years, that the valley of the shadow of death speaks of the pain of loss, but you can only feel pain if you first loved. That psalm, that piece of poetry, those words living in the valley of the shadow of death, if you feel that within yourselves, is not a testimony to pain and loss, it's a testimony to love, something that's good, something you could keep hold of and hope for. There is a story from the early church, and again, whether you're religious or not, I think this story has a lot of kind of value in it. There was a very famous uh, uh, monk in the early church who was a bit of a traveller, he wandered around everywhere really. Um, and one day he came to a city and he heard in this city a story about a woman who lived in a house and never moved out. So he went to see her and he went in the house and uh, kind of knocked on the door and introduced himself and then said to her, what are you doing sitting here around all day? And she said, I'm not sitting, I'm on a journey. That's really quite profound, isn't it? Because we think of journeys as, you know, flying off abroad or doing something exciting. But within all our lives, there is a journey. And the part of the journey we're concentrating on tonight is a journey we had that we share with somebody whom we loved, who has now died, whose loss causes us pain, but ultimately, whose memory can give us strength. So my hope and prayer for all of you this evening in our act of remembrance and our service is that yes, you will recognise the pain, but yes, also, you will have the strength to give thanks for the life shared and the love that inspired that life. We come now to our act of remembrance. This is where we focus on the candles that have been lit in memory of our loved ones. The prayers that we will read whilst looking at the candles are those that may well have been said at a funeral service that you attended. The prayers are in four sections, a prayer of thanks for your loved one, a prayer of remembering for our loved ones, a prayer for those who mourn and a prayer for any unfinished business. After each prayer, there'll be a moment's silence and I will then say the words, Lord, in your mercy. The response for you to say at home is hear our prayer. After this, there'll be one minute silence for your own thoughts and prayers, and I will then invite you to join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer. God of mercy, Lord of life, you has made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give thanks for those who remember here today, for the grace and mercy that they received from you, for all that was good in their life, and for memories that we treasure here today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You promised eternal life to those who believe. 
Remember for good your servants remembered here today as we remember them. Bring all who rest in Christ into the fullness of your kingdom where sins have been forgiven and death is no more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Look in mercy on our loved ones and all who mourn. Give them patient faith in times of darkness. Strengthen them with the knowledge of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are tender towards your children and your mercy is over all your works. Heal the memories of hurt and failure. Give us the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left here on earth to turn to Christ and follow in his steps in the way that leads to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, entrusting into your hands all that you have made, and rejoicing in our communion with all your faithful people, we make our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. We now have our minute's silence as we remember our loved ones. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
One of the things that's important to remember at this time of the year is a contribution made to the care of our loved ones by our colleagues from overseas, many of whom have made their homes here. We have returning to us this year Mohammed Nassim from our urology department to read two prayers in the Islamic tradition for those who are mourning and are bereaved and who have died, recognising both the work that those colleagues uh, put into our trust, but also at the same time those from the Islamic tradition who have lost their lives in the last 12 months. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the benevolent, and praise be to his prophet and salutations. اللهم اغفر له وارحمه وعافه واعف عنه واكرم نزله ووسع مدخله واغسله بالماء والثلج والبرد ونقه من الخطايا كما نقيت الصوب على ابجز من التنس وعبد الهدار خيرا من داره واحلا خيرا امن اهله وزوج خير من زوجه وادخل الجنه وعزه من عذاب القبر وعذاب النار والله forgive them and have mercy on them and give them strength and pardon them be generous to them and cause their entrance to be white and wash them with water and snow and hail clean them of their transgressions as white cloth is cleaned of stains give them an abode better than their home and a family better than their family and a wife better than their wife take them into paradise and protect them from the punishment of grave and from the punishment of hell fire allahumma aghfir li hayyatina wa mayyitina wa shahidina wa ghaibina wa saghirina wa kabirina wa zakarina wa unsana allahumma man ahyaytahu منا فاحشه على الاسلام ومن توفيته منا فتوفه على الايمان اللهم لا تحرمنا اجره ولا تذلنا بعده والله فغيف ار ليفينج ان ار ديد دوز هو ار وذ اس اند دوز هو ار ابسنت ار يونغ ان ار اولد ار مين فوك ان ار ويمن فوك والله Whomever you give life from among us, give him life in Islam. And whomever you take away from us, take him away in faith. O Allah, do not forbid us their reward and do not send us astray after them. May Allah accept their efforts, their shahada, and give them uh, peace and blessings in the life hereafter and forbearance. to the families to that there are challenges but there is also a future that lies ahead and so we need to encourage one another our grandchildren our families our friends our next interview is with one of our members of staff one of our porters who talks about the steps ahead We spoke earlier to Dave, one of our porters. We've got another one of our porters with us now, Richie, Richie McKinley, like, like a famous president. Richie, <laughs> Richie, how long have you been a porter here? So, yeah, five years now. Coming up five years, I've, I've been a porter. Um, it was it was a change for me. I've, I've been in construction all my life, um, carpenter actually. But yeah, I've, I've joined the portering team uh, 2017. Yeah, and I've never looked back. You've loved it, great. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm coming to Christmas, and I'm in a job as a carpenter. Is it quite a connection, isn't it? But yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I probably wasn't as good as. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Was he doing really that? Well, 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 we'll judge later. We'll judge yeah. later. <laughs> but one of the things that fascinated me about yourself, I and mean, you, like all of us, you kept going throughout the last 20 months, and, and the highs and the lows, and who knows what's going to happen over the winter, stuff like that. But you've been going into a young family every day. I mean, did that feel stressful or pressured in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, very much so. Um, even more so for my for my partner. Um, obviously, she doesn't work in a healthcare environment. She wasn't. She was just seeing all the news, the, the the bad. You know, there was a lot of bad press and a lot of scary press. So that's all she was seeing every day. And obviously, we we were here, like you know, we were doing as much hygiene as we possibly could. But we we were worried for the children, as um, as any parent would be. Um, it was a lot of it was the unknown as well because it was such a brand new. Um, disease with the pandemic, um, you know, it, we, nobody knew how bad it w was going to get, and we obviously knew it got really bad. Um, but yeah, it, it was scary. It was difficult at times, but yeah, still got to come and come and you know try and do as much as you can. Um, 
yeah, it's, it, was, it was vital to come to work. And, and what's been the most important thing for you in work over the past kind of 20 months? Has anything stood out in particular for you? Uh, the patients is, yeah, I mean, we are very much patient orientated. We're here for the patients. We do a lot of work with the different staff on different wards, um, but ultimately we're, we're here for the patient experience, um, making them comfortable. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them were scared, especially the ones with COVID. Again, the unknown was, was unprecedented. So it was, it was really scary for them. It was scary for us as well, having to go into a, a particular room, you know, a side room or um, a barrier room. And, but yeah, we, 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 we just, we, we cracked on. We, had, we, we got on with the job. And the, the main thing was comforting the patient, making sure they were there. And sometimes we can bring, you know, a bit of joy and, you know, a bit of laughter as well. And some, some say the laughter is the bed me, best medicine, but yeah, if we can make them laugh, uh, then it, it's, it's a good sign. One of the things that strikes me as Chaplin when I, when I see you, you people wandering around um, is that, and you're moving patients around, is there's quite a bit of conversation. I mean, is that an important part for the patient, you think, of what you do, is that? I think so. Um, in, in regards to the doctors and the medical staff, they, they, they're always talking medical jargon, for one, for a better phrase. I mean, I wouldn't know a lot about the medical stuff they're talking about, but the patient's there and they're listening to the doctor and the doctor's telling them the procedures, what might happen, what medication they might be on, you know, and they, 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 they want a, a, a sort of, you know, diagnosis from them. Whereas we talk to them on a personal level, you know, we, we, we find out what, they, what they've done for a job, what they do for a living, if they've got family. Um, obviously a lot of visitors haven't been allowed in for the last, the last uh, 20 months. So we were almost their, their visitors as well. You know, it was their chance to, to speak on a, on a sort of normal level. Now, speaking of jobs, I hear a rumor you're on the move. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, this is one of my, one of my final shifts for the poor and um, I, um, Again, for my family, I've, I've, uh, I've always wanted to try and develop my career in any career, whether it was construction or in hospital, um, in the healthcare. So I'm, I'm going to try and train to be a radiographer. So I'm actually moving to the radiology department in, uh, in the next few weeks, all being well. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to go and try and, try and, try and uh, do as much as I can there. You're excited about that? Very excited, yeah. I'm sad to leave the porters because there's such a good, good set of, uh, you know, lads and lasses that, that work for us. We're, we're, we're a family at the end of the day, you know. We all try and work together. Um, I'm sad to, to leave them, but I'm going to see them every day. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's onwards and upwards, pasture's new. <laughs> yeah. And you've got, you got plenty of exams to take with that? Plenty there will be, yeah. yeah. So I've just done a year at college. I've got another year at college to do. Uh, and then it'll be university then, and that's when it gets serious, yeah. <laughs> Very serious. Yeah. Richie, I'm sure like everybody who's watching our service this evening, I wish you all the best for that and, and good for you because very often, you know, we don't realise what we can achieve till we try and do it. That's it, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that, yeah. I mean, it, it, like you say, unless you try, you, you'll never know. A change is as good as the rest, they say as well, don't they? They do. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thanks, Ian.
blessing for the time that lies before us. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your faces, the rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand.